Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India class we are intending to talk about evolutionary economics. It is a part of the mainstream economics and also has qualities which makes it an optional paradigm to study economic processes. Before we go into study evolutionary economics proper, let us look at the idea of evolution. What do we mean when we use the word evolutionism? Evolutionism is a method of studying change. All phenomena, real, imaginary, physical, non-physical, are all subject to change. And this change can be studied in several ways. Evolution is one way in which most change is studied. The word to evolve is synonymous with the word to develop. So, evolution is also synonymous with development. As is well known, the word development itself means that something goes through different states and that these states are sequentially connected. So, change is something going through different states and we talk of it as a development process or an evolving process, when we see the change happening from one state to another in a connected fashion. So, when we talk of something evolving, we will always assume that a given state has developed or come about sequentially from some earlier state or states. Likewise, it gives way and leads to states or state in the future. So, evolution is a process. What is it that connects one state with another? In other words, how do we know that there is a sequential relationship between a particular state and the ones before it and the ones after it? We do not know. We presume that there is some principle, underlying principle which connects these states in some logical, in some processual relationship. So, evolutionism involves three things. One, change, two, a sequential relationship between the states involved in change and three, a principle or principles which are said to underlie the sequence of states and the connections between them both logically and processually. We can then think in terms of broadly two types of evolution. We can think in terms of linear and non-linear evolution. It would be nice if we can illustrate both these through the same universe of discourse or the same discipline. So, let us see if we can cite illustration of linear evolution 
and nonlinear evolution from simple mathematics. When we say 2 plus 2 equals 4 and 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 6, we are talking of a numerical evolution. Here the principle of evolution is summation and the sequence of changes is from 2 to 4 to 6. So, this is a linear process of evolution because there is a specific logic and that is a linear logic summation. All additive relationships are fundamentally linear. It is a simple example of a linear evolution. You can have real life phenomena or you can have physical phenomena which can also evolve in a linear fashion. Thoughts for instance are substantially linear processes. Thoughts are linear in the sense that one thought leads to another and that leads to another and all thoughts are always connected to previous thoughts. But the principle that connects one thought to another is substantially not known. So, the process of linearity of thought is well known, well accepted by psychology, but the construction of thought, the processes through which one thought is connected to another, the principles underlying this might be many, but fundamentally thoughts are connected in a linear fashion. You cannot have thoughts coming out of the blue from nowhere one thought always arrives as a sequence of some other thought. We might be able to, able to perceive the sequence, we might not be able to perceive the sequence. In mathematics, you can think of another example which is nonlinear. There is a particular theory in mathematics which says that if you state a particular dependent variable as a function of maybe 10, 12, 20, 100, 300 independent variables and you draw a functional equation, simple rules of mathematics should tell you that if you keep changing the independent variables by the same proportion, constant proportion, the dependent variable should also change by the constant proportion. For example, take a mathematical modeling of climate. I am saying this because climate is a very interesting example of the nonlinear evolutionary processes and of a toolkit in mathematics which studies such nonlinear processes. Climate at any point of time, let us say the quantum of rainfall is the dependent variable and there are any number of in independent variables that you can think of. Some of them we can directly relate to in terms of temperature, humidity, wind directions and so on and so forth. There are many which are not directly relatable, but which are very much present. In short, a particular meteorological development, a particular climatological development is caused by many, many, many variables. Suppose we are able to formulate all these variables in a single equation form and suppose we keep changing all these independent variables by a constant percentage, would it mean that rainfall would increase or decrease by a constant percentage? Logically it would seem so, but it does not happen. Not because it is rainfall, but because this is a particular kind of mathematical relationship where there is discontinuity which is not visible. You can go on increasing all the 100 variables, independent variables by uniform 1 percent, 1 percent, 1 percent, 1 percent and you might find the dependent variable increasing uniformly by 1 percent. Suddenly you might find it taking a leap 4 percent or suddenly it might be saying no change. In other words, there is a nonlinear discontinuity involved in this. Studies of such nonlinearity, studies of such discontinuities are in mathematics a part of a theory called the theory of chaos or morphogenesis. 
the whole theory of chaos or the theory of morphogenesis is about these nonlinear discontinuities. So, you have simple logic as a linear evolutionary process, then you have a chaos relationship or a chaotic relationship as an example of a nonlinear evolutionary process. Simply within mathematics, you can think of these two alternative evolutionary models. More generally, if we concede that thought in human psychology has a linear structure of evolution, then you can say imagination has a totally non-linear structure of evolution. It is very difficult to articulate how a particular image in a sequence of imagination is connected to another image in the same sequence of imagination, which is what imagination is all about. It is a construct which does not follow a linear pattern. Purely as an aside, this interesting contrast between thought as linear formations and linear structures of evolution of human consciousness, in contrast with imagination, which is a non-linear construct, non-linear forms of imagination constitutes the basis of a very major debate between the philosophical school of modernism and postmodernism. The finest examples of modernism are philosophies like positivism, which are very linear in construction. And the finest examples of nonlinear evolution of thought are like the ideas of well, whom can we think of? I am trying to think of somebody in the 19th century, Nietzsche. Have you heard of Nietzsche? Nietzsche is often cited by postmodernists as the greatest simply because he not only wrote about the power of imagination but he also wrote stinging responses to anybody who talked about rationality and reason. But we are not here concerned about modernism and postmodernism. We are concerned about evolution, linear and nonlinear. At this point, it would suffice to say that we can think of linear and nonlinear evolutionary processes. Most evolutionary philosophies underlie principles which are much more complex than simple additive relationships. We have seen that linear processes are usually additive, at best multiplicative, but not more than that. Simple arithmetic relationship is involved in linear processes. Whereas, in non-linear non processes, as we have already seen in the illustration of chaos, you do not know, there are discontinuities. Most philosophies of evolution involve principles of change which are substantially nonlinear. It is in this genre that we are thinking in terms of evolutionary theories like that of Darwin. Tell me something about Darwin, Irene. Very nice, very nice and I am glad we are not asking who is the mother of evolution here, not Saddam Hussein I hope. Well anyway, the long and short of it all is that Darwin is associated with modern evolutionism almost in a founder's capacity. Can you tell me something about what Darwin was talking about? I will give you a start. It had something to do with origin of species and what else? Vishnu? Uh, he said that we evolved, like life evolved from uh, unicellular to multicellular and then the uh, uh, I, I do not know if he 
came up with the, he didn't come up with survival of the fittest. No? It was well, uh, he, he did say things which led to survival of the fittest, but either way, yes, Darwin was talking of evolution of populations, of species as a process of natural selection. Darwin was talking of the state of nature as a competitive environment, where different populations of species were competing for resources, survival resources. So, in the process of survival, some species in a particular environment of survival seem to be better fitted than some other species. So, species which are better fitted survive through that environment, species which are not so well fitted to that environment do not survive through that environment. This process of fitness is the process of natural selection. Natural selection because it is a, it's a non voluntary process, I mean there is no volition involved here. The populations concerned are not human populations which are calculating odds, they are populations of species and they respond naturally in their, in their own elements of survival and reproduction. And selection here is purely in terms of whether the conditions in the environment in which a particular species is living are conducive to the perpetuation both in terms of survival and in terms of reproduction of that species. If that happens, then you can say that that species is naturally selected and found to be fit. If not, the creature is found to be unfit and the creature is not selected. Now, in this, during early interpretations of Darwin, early interpretations of evolutionism, there was a tendency to assume the environment to be a constant. And keeping environment constant, constant, the process of selection was viewed as a kind of a dynamic among a limited number of species. But not much long after Darwin, it was understood that the variable in this whole thing is the environment. Climate changes, weather changes, rainfalls change, temperature changes and when that happens, species which seem to be suited to a particular temperature regime find themselves confronted with different temperature regimes and therefore, the question of whether, whether they are fitted, whether they are fit to survive in the new temperature regime comes up and that is found out through experience whether they survive or not. So, as environment is a dynamic flowing and entity, different species or different populations of different species are located in this very dynamic flowing environment and their survivability is tested and some are selected, some are not selected. This is the process of natural selection. So, through history, through history of the species, whole populations evolve as survivors, whole populations cease to be as non survivors. So, diversity of human existence, I am sorry, diversity of existence of populations of species arises through a process of continuous branching out when challenged by conditions of environment, species branch out into those subspecies which can survive and are selected, those subspecies which cannot survive and are not selected. So, there is endless growth of complexity in life and this growth of complexity in life is literally a process of branching out of life as it were under changing environmental conditions. Now, this is broadly the evolutionism of Darwin. What is important to note at this point are the idea that survival is based on the fitness. Fitness not in a modern gym sense, 
fitness in the sense of appropriateness. Are you fitted to this environment? Are you, are you fitted to this environment would simply mean that are you suited? Is your existence appropriate to the conditions in which you are and so forth? So, fitness is not in a modern physical sense of you know certain attributes which are given and which are which are evaluative symbols of whether you are you know fit in that sense or not. No, fitness in a Darwinian sense is more like suitedness, appropriateness and that varies as environment varies. No species has an initial fitness, but some species develop fitness, fitness through adaptation and then they branch off as to survivors and non survivors and so life in its complexity proceeds. Now, what is important to see here is that in this view, it is an explanation of not just how life perpetuates, but it is also an explanation of how life originates. Because some species must have at some point of time started the whole game. They must have evolved, branched out into complexities and they must have subsequently branched out into survivors, non-survivors. In short, over a period of time, the very profile of life is written in the way selection, natural selection process functions. Now, this is a direct challenge to the theological idea of the origin and sustenance of life. The book of Genesis of Christianity tells it Christianity tells you all about the origin of life from a theological point of view. <coughs> Up to the 19th century, the strong point on the idea of the origin of the universe according to book of Genesis was never questioned. But the coming into existence of Darwinian ideas immediately raised the question of the meaningfulness, appropriateness and relevance of the whole theological approach to life. So, Darwin became posed as the representative of modern science which questions superstitions coming from religion. So, Darwin assumed tremendous importance not only Darwin, but the idea of natural selection and evolution acquired tremendous importance during and after the age of enlightenment about which we know already. The 19th century was recognized as the age of reason and part of it was the success or due to the success of the idea of evolution as a very successful alternative to the theological notion of life. So, you might say that at this point in time, whether Darwin's ideas were substantively adequate to make it the causa celebre as it were, or whether the historical context in which Darwin's ideas themselves acquired much more importance is a very interesting question. So, from a purely, purely on a lighter note Darwinian point of view, Darwin's evolutionism kind of selected itself in the historical context in which it was found. And that in a sense is the heart of what happened in the 19th century. Another 19th century view of evolution is attributable to Lamarck, the Frenchman. Subsequently, Lamarckism got subsumed under Darwinism, but what is attributable to Lamarck are two important concepts in evolution. One is that species not only adapt and evolve according to the selection process, they also pick up and discard, they also 
use and disuse their own characteristics during the process of adaptation and selection. I remember, have you heard of Arthur Kressler? Well, you must read Arthur Kressler, uh, tremendous writer aside from anything else, there is a lovely little novel of modern science and evolution written by him on Lamarckism. It was an interesting title called the case of the midwife toad, midwife toad. There is a toad which is called a midwife toad. It carries the young on behalf of the female of the species and brings up the young. In short, it, it incubates the eggs, it is a male, it incubates the eggs and the young are born and Chrysler argues that according to studies, midwife toad is a classic case of Lamarckian evolution. Toads with under particular conditions picked up the trait of becoming midwife. So, it is an interesting case cited by Chrysler, but what I am trying to state here is that one of the principles of Lamarckism is that species pick up the use and disuse of characteristics according to the environment. And the second aspect of Lamarckism is that such characteristics which are picked up or discarded are passed on from one generation of members of the species to another. So, that you have evolution as an inheritable quality in Lamarck's evolutionism. Be that as it may, we know now that evolution in a biological sense involves a process of selection, looking upon nature as a field which is competitive for resources, resources for survival and reproduction and looking upon nature as a dynamic variable field and not as a static field for survival. Granted these things, the process of selection throws up complexity in a manner which is unpredictable. It is unpredictable because you do not know the changes that the field called nature itself will undergo through time. So, this is evolutionism, one branch of it being Darwinism, another branch which was later subsumed into Darwinism was Lamarckism. Now, what is interesting is social Darwinism. As I said, Darwin's ideas were path breaking in the sense that they broke many mental blocks of the age of enlightenment and afterwards. Incidentally, I do not know if you recall my talking to you about the age of enlightenment and how there was a bunch of Frenchmen were known as the encyclopedists. Do you remember my talking to you about the encyclopedists? Anyway, it does not matter. These were people who believed in classifying all flora and fauna in as much detail as possible as a part of the first creative scientific venture. It lasted 40, 50 years their work and quite a lot of monumental studies were produced by them. Evolution was a kind of a sequel in the age of enlightenment to the work of people like the encyclopedists. I am not saying that Darwin picked up things from encyclopedists, but encyclopedists were a concerted attempt to look at nature in great detail. And Darwin went one step further and looked at a process of selection which nature was, was characterized by. Evidently, just as Newton's laws impressed a lot of people outside physics as being very substantive positive statements about the universe, so too Darwin's evolutionism struck a lot of people as stating something very fundamental about the laws of life. Certainly, it enabled a lot of people to believe that they were out of the clutches of theological superstition. However, 
there were people like Herbert Spencer in the second half of the 19th century who believed that science had given way to a new way of looking at life, a new lifestyle which humanity had at its disposal so that people could live lives of reason, lives of knowledge rather than lives of superstition and ignorance. Spencer himself was a kind of a biologist, a kind of an evolutionist, a philosopher, all woven in one. But Spencer also is known among sociologists as a social Darwinist. Spencer was struck that the world of nature is a competitive world because he said the world of man is competitive. Human society appeared to him to be something like Darwin's nature. So, by then already as you know Adam Smith's invisible hand had acquired tremendous popularity across Europe. What is invisible hand? Can somebody tell me? Vigyan, take a shot. Right. Market seems to work almost intangibly across space and across time, leading to allocation of resources, most importantly, efficiently without wastage. It is almost as if a hand invisibly is sorting out where different resources should go and how much production should happen and so on and so forth. And this invisible hand appeared to Spencer as the hand of selection. He said the market is actually selecting participants in the market as those who survive, who are survivors, who are fit and who are not fit. In other words, those who are capable of being selected and those who are not capable of being selected and who are rejected by the market. So, success in an enterprise was seen by people like Spencer as a process of selection through the market and they saw the market as the medium of evolution of human society. So, successful entrepreneurs in the market were successful human beings in society and successful human beings in society became leaders of society and therefore, they saw an evolutionism in the functioning of the market through the institutions of property in selecting leaders and elite for society and thereby enabling society to read its own reach its own perfection. So, this is broadly the belief of people like Herbert Spencer. As I said therefore, society as analogous to nature, the competitiveness of nature according to people like Spencer is inherent in the competitiveness of market. In a world of individuals related to each other through entitlements over property, interacting and in the process of interacting throwing up goods and services and throwing up some who are better fits in the process of selection of the market who grow as successful entrepreneurs, some who do not who are failures as entrepreneur who are rejects and the dynamics of social development is seen by people like Spencer in the process of selection through market based on institutions of property and on the spirit of individualism. So, society selects the affluent in a Darwinian fashion and society selects its leaders because affluent become leaders. 
in a Darwinian fashion and therefore the evolution of society itself is a growth, growth process of the economy and society and evolution, the philosophy of evolution was identified by people like Herbert Spencer as the key to understanding social development. Now, Spencer was immensely popular in the later part of 19th century, when he traveled across United States and lectured eulogizing American development as the ultimate selection process. And he doubtless was very popular amongst Americans. So, he had large number of followers in the United States, although he himself was an Englishman. And thus, by the end of the 19th century, social Darwinism was immensely popular. There are still modern day adherents to the social Darwinism. The great economist, worshipper of freedom, Milton Friedman, has a lovely book, Free to Choose. If you read that book, it is a lovely book because it is a great advocacy of a particular ideology and it is a great powerful advocacy of a particular way of looking at economic processes. And one thing which Friedman is very concerned about and very concerned to articulate is that market is an evolutionary process. Selections in the market are selections in an evolutionary process. In other words, both Spencer and Friedman are able to perceive something almost moral about the theory of evolution. This is how far the following for evolutionism as a philosophy had happened, especially as a counter to theology. Belief in large parts of Christian theology had become very shaky by the 19th century, not just because of the rise of scientific thought and scientific inquiry, not be just because of the growth of, math growth of mathematics not just because of the growth of modern philosophies which grew away from theological foundations, but also because the church as an institution itself had thrown itself into very shaky position. From the 16th century onwards, the church as a single monolithic institution of faith of the Christian world was broken into pieces of or fragments of systems of faith following Christ. Following this too is the growth of knowledge of science, growth of belief in science, growth of belief in the scientific method. So that you know what is happening I am trying to suggest to you is that belief in the church as an institution of delivery of knowledge. I shall be asking you to recollect this in the second half of today's lecture when I say the church as an organization containing a particular dealing with a particular delivery of knowledge about the world became shaky in its foundations. So, the belief in this organization as a deliverer of knowledge about the world becomes weak. And as an alternative approach arises, which is able to explain another organization, which is a society as a deliverer of knowledge, then the faith gradually moves from the church to people like Spencer and social Darwinism. What I am trying to say is, it seems to me, humor aside, some kind of a selection process seems to be at work in the very realm of the subject called knowledge. Somewhere along the course, there is a rise and fall of systems of thought and knowledge in a broad fit to a context which is empirical. Somewhere along the course, 
the empirical fit of a particular idea triggers a rising or falling belief, which seems to be the mechanism of selection in society. I am just, just trying to suggest that if Herbert Spencer became popular, it was because it seems to me that in that context of at which, in which he was speaking, his ideas appear to be a better fit. So, there was a selection process it seems at work there. However, we are at the end of discussing social Darwinism, we are now ready to talk about economic evolutionism. Evolutionism in economics has to be understood in a separate context other than just as a philosophical tool, because the contrast for evolutionism in economics is the economic orthodoxy as prevalent in neoclassical or Keynesian economics. There is no scope or place fundamentally, fundamentally for evolution as a process in economic theory, because economic theory assumes that the problem is very clearly written out and the solution is very clearly evident large number of people trying to satisfy a large number of virtually unlimited wants using limited means and thereby facing scarcity and all of them are endowed with rationality and they are able to execute choices which are rational in resolving their problem of scarcity and therefore, in such a resolution occurs an allocation of resources, which under ideal conditions would be most efficient. There is no place for evolution in this, there is no place, place for selection, there is no place for fitness in this. Do you perceive what I am saying? Look at Marshallian economics or look at neoclassical economics, look at general equilibrium. Any number of producers in the market, any number of consumers in the market, all of them trying to satisfy unlimited wants through limited means and all of them competing with each other for resources and the market is a fabric of competition in the sense that they are all people who are bidding against each other for resources and those who are higher bidders get the resources, those who are lower bidders do not get these resources and therefore, the process goes on, but there is not much scope for selection here. It is just a kind of an act of exercise in efficiency, right. You want me to restate that? What I am trying to argue is look at look at the neoclassical economics. Neoclassical economics is all about efficiency firm which is able to equate average cost with average revenue is a survivor, firm which is not able to do that is not a survivor, it, it incurs losses. So, that is it. In the process of all the firms using the same methodology of competing, the same methodology of cost cutting and optimizing, some firms come to stay, some firms do not come to stay and that is perfect competition and that is it. In other words, neoclassical economics rather than talking about selection and evolution is talking about some methodology or paradigm, which would ensure economic bliss, right. All the participants in the market follow that methodology, the market reaches full employment, the market reaches a perfect competitive state. In short, there is nowhere to go beyond that, nowhere to evolve beyond that, it is simply bliss. Am I not right? It is in this framework that evolution becomes important, because the earliest evolutionist in economics is none other than the man who wrote the history of economics, Joseph Schumpeter. Schumpeter's history of economic analysis is probably pioneering, precisely because Schumpeter himself was thinking of an alternative way of looking at economics, an outstanding mind. Schumpeter's idea 
of how economic systems work, uh, how alternative models of economic activity work. Schumpeter's, Schumpeter's idea of capitalism, Marxism, democracy, all of which are very profound, enable him to think of capitalism not as a bliss solution as neoclassical economics is thinking of, but as a situation which is very dynamic, very fluid and which throws up enormous challenges and responses to and from the participants in the market. And he looks upon the growth of capitalism as a very dynamic, discontinuous process involving rules of evolution, which he was probably the first one to state in economics. The book which is classic from our point of view of Schumpeter is Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. If you get a chance, read that. When I was an undergraduate or when I was a graduate student, when I, was, when I first saw this book, I thought it was some kind of a publicity about democracy, especially the title Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. I later realized after reading it I, that it is an extremely profound book which does not accept all that is said about capitalism in the orthodoxy of economics. It looks upon with great respect the writings of Karl Marx and most importantly, it looks upon the sources of dynamism, of dynamism and growth in capitalism and its political forms. So, it turned out to be a great book and I still think it is a great book. What we shall do in the next hour is to look at Schumpeter's evolution, economic evolutionism and following that we shall look at modern economic evolutionism and hopefully complete our study with a discussion of the writings of Nelson and Winter on evolutionary economics. So, with this we shall take a little break and come back again after some time.